Last week, Intel finally got round to launching their 11th gen Rocket Lake desktop processors, and the reviews were fairly poor. The comments below the videos were absolutely brutal from you people, and I cannot say you were wrong. So specifically, the Core i9-11900K, it suffered from a couple of failings. It's only eight cores, it takes an awful lot of power to run at a high clock speed, and it's terribly expensive. Clearly the business about clock speed and power, those two things are closely related. The eight core thing I'm gonna cover again briefly, but we've been there before, and the pricing. To me what that says is that Intel's looking ahead to 12th gen Alder Lake, and they don't want to accept the idea that Intel is the budget brand, particularly at the high end, the i9s. Whether it should be a Core i9, different question, but whatever they're gonna call the next high-end processor, they don't want you getting the idea it should be 400 pounds. You should be thinking at least 500, maybe 600. So the whole palaver with only eight cores, a step back from the previous generation, that, as we know, is because Intel stuck on 14 nanometer. The new cores, the Cypress Cove cores, which are reimagined Ice Lake cores, they're bigger than the previous Skylake cores. There's only space for eight cores on the same socket. Intel had said they were gonna to stick to LGA 1200, so the socket size was fixed, the cores got larger, the core count dropped from 10 to eight. The question we didn't ask when Rocket Lake launched, indeed in the run-up to Rocket Lake launching is, could Intel have actually manufactured a desktop processor on 10 nanometer? It was just kind of accepted it wasn't possible. We've got Tiger Lake going up to four cores. We're waiting for eight core processors, particularly in uh, grunty laptops. And on the desktop, here we are at 14 nanometer. It was kind of accepted that the 10 nanometer process was so terribly broken that Intel couldn't do a desktop processor on 10 nanometer at the moment. They had to fix the process first. However, that is not correct. Intel has just launched their third gen Intel Xeon scalable processors. 10 nanometer ice lake up to 40 cores. You will note they have 20% IPC improvement over the previous gen, with Rocket Lake broadly speaking the same number, gen over gen. However, these are ice lake on 10 nanometer, Rocket Lake cores on 14 nanometer. And then we see various other boasts about third gen Intel Xeon scalable. We've got a 1.46 times average performance increase in various tests, we've got a 1.74 times AI inference increase, and a 2.65 times average performance increase versus a five-year-old system. Other features of the new Xeons, there are some big numbers. We've got up to six terabytes of system memory. We're talking here Optane Persistent as opposed to regular DDR4. With DDR4, it's four terabytes, still a monumental number. It's now eight channel memory rather than six channel. And we've got PCI Express Gen 4. Before I go on, have you subscribed to Kit Guru Tech? If you haven't, do please subscribe now. And while you're at it, do please ring the bell. The chart for the feeds and speeds for the new Xeons, which include pricing, are of interest. We can discount the four and eight socket scalable performance processors because they are still on 14 nanometer, their previous gen. They top out at 28 cores. If we look at the middle of the chart, however, we see the new 10 nanometer parts going up to 40 cores. It seems fairly clear that the 40 and possibly 38 core parts are really reviewer specials. Up to 36 cores is what Intel is likely to be able to sell the person with the right amount of money. When we look at a comparison of how the Sunny Cove cores inside Ice Lake compare to the previous Cascade Lake hardware, we see the new processors are better in all manner of respects. And then we move to how the third gen Xeon scalable compares to second gen. We've got more cores, more cache, more memory channels, more memory speed, better interconnect, PCI Express Gen 4, a bunch of extra instructions, and what they call, this is lovely, this platform adjacencies for various versions of Intel Optane and also new SSDs and super duper fast ethernet. These parts are all essential to servers and they are monumentally huge numbers. Also, of course, shows that Intel has many strings to its bow. And indeed, it has FPGA. AMD does not yet have FPGA, although they're looking to buy a company in that field. But how does Xeon Scalable compare to Epic? 
Epic has more than Xeon, many more cores, up to 64 cores, and yet Intel is claiming it can have wins over AMD because AMD has those chiplets, whereas Intel is monolithic, therefore Intel has less latency or lower latency than AMD. And you think, well, that might be true. On the other hand, if you're running virtual machines and you pin them to CCDs or CCXs, then latency ceases to be a thing, quite frankly. And an Epic can support a great many virtual machines in one processor. Also, it seems a reasonable question. If AMD goes up to 64 cores and Intel goes up to 40, but probably 36, what happens if you want to run, for example, 48 cores uh, to run one particular virtual machine? What if you've got 96, 100 threads worth of uh, processing requirement? How's Intel going to accommodate that? It's going to accommodate it surely with a dual processor setup. And if you're telling me the latencies for that don't drop through the floor, well, fair enough. Let's head to Intel Arc and compare a few of these Xeons. We've got the new third gen 8380, which is a platinum part costing 8,000 bucks. That's 40 cores of 10 nanometer ice lake. We've got the 6348, which is a gold part rather than a platinum. That's also 10 nanometer ice lake, priced just over $3,000. 28 cores and then we've got the 6258R which is a second gen Xeon scalable now we're back to the old 14 nanometer that's priced just under four thousand dollars also 28 cores so if we compare the new 28 core with the old 28 core the new is cheaper it packs in more memory channels it's got PCI Express Gen 4 but just take a look at the clock speeds on paper if you're to compare those two processors the new processor looks inferior to the old processor. If you add in the ecosystem around the processor, storage, memory, Optane, fast ethernet, then you would expect the new system would be faster than the old system. But processor against processor, the new Ice Lake 10 nanometer third gen Xeon scalable does not look good. So let's head back to the premise that Intel might have manufactured the desktop Rocket Lake part on 10 nanometer with Ice Lake cores. How many cores would we have got into the LGA 1200 socket? Potentially double uh, over the previous gen, 14 nanometer down to 10 nanometer, all other things being equal, potentially double. They're bigger cores, so let's take off a bit for luck. Let's say 16 cores. So. 10th gen up to 10 cores, and instead of cutting back to eight cores on 11th gen, I think they could well have gone to 16 cores. Take a look at the table of feeds and speeds for the new Xeons, and particularly look at the 16 core models. The clock speeds are absolutely dire. They don't come anywhere near even four gigahertz. And with the 6346 model, that's a TDP of 205 watts. Now, nominally, Rocket Lake has a TDP of 125 watts, but if you turn on adaptive boost and you push the speeds beyond five gigahertz, the power draw goes absolutely crazy crackers, goes up to like 290 watts for the CPU. Pull back the speed to something sane, something approaching five gigahertz, and you're sub 200 watts. You're around 190 watts for the processor. So, judging by the figures that Intel has given us for the new Xeon's 10 nanometer Ice Lake, if they had produced Rocket Lake on 10 nanometer and bumped up the core count to 16, the clock speeds, in my opinion, would have been absolutely terrible, even with the same monstrous power draw as the Rocket Lake we actually got to see. There is absolutely no denying that Rocket Lake, in particular the Core i9, got slated by the reviewers and by the viewing public. As I said before, the comments below my review were vicious, aimed, I hasten to add, at Intel, not at me. Thank you for that. And yet, if Intel had gone 10 nanometer and had increased the core count, almost regardless of what they'd done with pricing, I think you would have been even more disappointed with the product. Here's my conclusion. I think Intel did exactly the right thing, retaining the 14 nanometer process and fudging those cores. If they were determined to produce a new 
processor on the desktop early in 2021, this was pretty much the only option they had. They've taken some flack, no denying the flack was well deserved. The pricing is just wrong for this processor, no doubt about it in my opinion. However, I don't doubt that people are buying those processors and that proves Intel would be correct. What's going to happen with 12th Gen Alder Lake? Time will tell. Right now, however, 11th Gen, despite looking like a total mess, I think there's actually some logic behind Intel's strategy. Funny old life.